All right, I'm here. Let's get this film. Let's get this over with. Hey, real quick before we film, I wanted to show you this. The sheath for my machete. Look at that there. But what? Why are you looking at me like that? Adrian's given Dalton clothing. What? Clothing, Adrian. Dalton is free. No, 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 no. This is a sheath. No, this is clothing, this goes Adrian. Around your belt so you can finish the yard. Dalton is free. He no longer works for you. Sit down. Give me my machete. Welcome to Shrimp Cover Lid, I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here with this week's edition of... This is Adrian Reed's Harry Potter. This is the grand finale, ultimo, part two, the conclusion of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. You finished it. I did. You did. And I you feel, feel good about it. Changed well, I feel your life. Like, I feel accomplished. Accomplished? I don't feel good. Good and accomplished, they kind Very of go different together. things. Not at all. Very different Not things. Not at all. Uh, you hedonist. <laughs> so, a uh, little bit of breakdown. Chapters we hit here. Chamber of Secrets. Uh, we get a, we learn about the mask list through Hermione because, you know, as Hermione in the library, she saves the day nonetheless. Uh, we find out that Lockhart was not all he was cracked up to be, and we delve into the chamber via the bathroom. The heir of Slytherin, we get the showdown with Voldemort, and Fox turns out to be the grand hero, delivering the sword of Godric Gryffindor to Harry's need. And finally, Dobby's reward. Lucius Malfoy sucks as a person, and Dobby's a free elf. Not a lot of surprises there. Not a lot of surprises there. I think you're going to have some surprises with this, though. Definitely got a lot to talk about. Okay. Um, especially with this as a, the wrap-up of a book. First off, I think that a fitting subtitle for this book in the Harry Potter series would have been, My Anaconda Don't Want None Unless You Speak That Parcel Tongue. That's clever. I That's think brilliant. that goes that goes very well with what happened here. If that starts trending and you're like the reason Harry Potter's ruined on the internet, I will be so happy. If anything, it will be a resurgence in the reading of Harry Potter. <laughs> because that's how things work in my life. I shit on them and they come back stronger than before. And isn't that a great thing? No. Yes, it is. Tired of this already. So what is, do there, you wanna... is there a third book? Yes, there's a third no! book. No! There are seven books and we are going to move on. And we're going to power through this. And because you can't read the comments, you won't know that there is a call to action that we should read Lord of the Rings next. I'm not making that You're up. You're making that I'm up. I'm not making that you up. You brought that up three, four times now. People are so excited about it. We're you are making that now. up. I am not making that up. There are no anyway, Lord of the Rings fans. What is your first Harry Potter point that I can break down for you? You know, one of the things that I find interesting in literature to do is to read the book with the perspective of another character in mind. Okay. Um, you'll find a lot of times that it is not the protagonist who suffers the most or who goes through the most drastic change in a piece. Okay. Um, it is arguable, but I would say that in this second book, Hermione suffers the most. Okay. She was petrified, for Christ's sake. She was petrified, uh, yes. And um, she was, now I think it's important to note where that petrification came. It came as soon as she figured the whole deal out. Yes. So it was right after winning that she lost. Uh, I'm gonna say Ginny Weasley suffered more. Oh, I, and, you know, I, but and main I can, character wise, right. absolutely, I Hermione can, was the sufferer. But I can I can see that that Ginny could have suffered the most. Yes. But still, it was not Harry Potter. Okay, it was not. Um, who lost the most? Who lost the most? Gilderoy Lockhart, obviously. Uh, oh, maybe. Yeah. You know, Gilderoy's I, I done. I won't say that is not the case. But he doesn't know he's done. He's just. But I mean, in the context of the novel. In the context of the novel. In these three hundred and eighty pages or whatever. I don't know. Dumbledore. You think so? Dumbledore was on top of the magic world to unemployed. Okay. Now, okay. Hagrid's investment in that world was larger. Okay. Because you, you feel that Dumbledore is going to go on and be all right. Yes. Hagrid's not. In, Hagrid's as, going to prison. As a prisoner of Azkaban. <laughs> um, and, and, and Hagrid's someone who's already led a rough life, it seems. Yes. Um, and moving on, I said, I said last week that the Harry Potter series was sexist. Okay. I want to maintain that. Okay. Harry Potter's sexist because Ginny and Hermione are the victims and they need, uh, they need their knights in shining armor, don't they? Okay. They need that magic little man to come along and save them. And that's your problem with Harry Potter? Argue with me. Argue, Argue with me. Say, say it's not. I, it's not, Adrian. We're going to be tweeted at endlessly uh, for this, but. <laughs> uh, it's, 
It's sexist. It's, it's right. Imagine that this piece was written by by a man. Yes. And the woman and, came to save the man. No, no, no. And the man came to save the woman. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Both of these women need saving by a by a man. Okay. Don't they? Uh, I would argue at the sake of if it wasn't for Hermione though. Harry Potter would not have been the hero. Hermione's the true hero here. She's the one who discovered what the Basilisk but is. But even as the hero, she needs saving, doesn't she? She I guess needs she, does. she needs that big strong man to come along that and that big strong man. And, and pluck her out of uh, out of uh, the jaws of defeat. Okay. Um well, argue with me. Do you have anything to say about that? Prove me right. Prove me I, wrong. Unfortunately, like, I'm sitting here trying to think of an argument as to why Harry Potter wouldn't be sexist. But I don't have But it fits one. into all those same boxes. It does. It doesn't does. it? Now, uh, I think in, instead of that meaning that Harry Potter is sexist, to me what I suggest is that there's a lot of sexism put where it's not. Okay. And again, I Which could, will be tweeted at endlessly because of <laughs> I could argue again that this is, again, written for children. Does that, that mean a, that it is not supposed to be? That sensitive? is a very stereotypical trope of children's literature. That the boy has to be the, the, the good prince guy. saves the princess. That's what we're looking at. Right, but even 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 that first wave of feminism, that's what that was arguing against. Yes. Was that that doesn't always have to be the case. Okay. So you've got this woman author, this female author coming along and saying, ah, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and write about it as the case. That's the case. It is the case. That's it's what, what it we're is. gonna do. And All since it's children's years, literature, no one's gonna argue, is that what you're saying? I, uh, you make this difficult every week. You really do. Why because aren't you prepared for it then? I you mean, bring up points that you're like, argue this. Tell me I'm wrong. But you're not. So I don't know what to say to you. So, okay. So instead of just doing it that way, I want you to close your eyes. Okay. Imagine how much hatred's going to be in these uh, comment sections. Oh, it's beautiful. And tell me what it says. That's what I need from you. You big strong man. Listen, if anyone on the internet's going to be like, sexism, Dalton is a sexist, and I'm like, you don't know me at all, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would assume the comments would be saying, oh, Adrian's a man, so he sees this as sexist. Uh, he's trying to play the reverse of what we would, the, the expected, whereas a, typically a female would see this as sexist. Right, but that's not me just playing the other side. I mean, that side Adrian is there. Is saying that that's in the text. Adrian is saying that the women in this text are weak. That's what it's going to say. Where the is argument, that in the text? The argument is going to be that Hermione is not a weak character. And I don't Ginny think, is Hermione's weak. my favorite character in the series. Yes. But she needs the saving of the big strong man in this, doesn't she? She does. Okay. Okay. So I want you to I want you to take the beating there. Uh, I will because no one else for, any, gets these. for anyone. Yeah, for anyone watching who doesn't know this, Dalton's the only one who reads the comments to these videos, so that Adrian does not get spoiled on anything. Because this is literally my first run through the Harry Potter world. Yes. I haven't seen the movies, read the books, anything. Um, and and luckily, here's another thing that might be worth mentioning here: Harry Potter. The terms have diffused into pop culture maybe a little bit. Okay. But the story has not in the way that like in, we're going to be getting to Carrie on the channel. Yes. I've never read Carrie. I know the story. Okay, right? but you don't it's know in the, the story of Harry Potter. Right. It's in the air. Okay. Uh, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Right. That does. Now, I want you to do your thinking about Myrtle. Okay. How did Myrtle die? Myrtle died because she was the, vic the first victim when the Chamber of Secrets was opened. Who killed her? The basilisk. The snake. The snake, whatever you want to call it, yes. Uh, the snake is from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. So what is the forbidden, what is the forbidden fruit in that situation? Why was, why was Myrtle in the bathroom? I, I assume because she was being She was being bullied. bullied. So is bullying the forbidden fruit or is the sin to give in to bullying? Because okay. she's in the bathroom crying because of bullying, and that's when that's when she bites the apple. Now, last week you were giving the argument that bullying is almost promoted here through Ron. Right. Uh, that it's okay because when there's a weak victim, you should take him out. So maybe bullying is the forbidden fruit here, but the forbidden fruits is what got Myrtle killed. So. But was it bullying or was it giving in? Because she was only in the bathroom. Because she, she wouldn't have been there had she not right. given into it. Uh, so maybe that is a very deep layered note uh, to the younger reading audience being like, hey, this isn't what you do. Stand up for yourself. Because uh, if you don't, a snake's going to kill you in the bathroom. Right. Also, so. 
What was Hermione doing when she was knocked off? She was reading in the library. She was researching. Right. Going for knowledge. Yes. Knowledge. Knowledge. I, I hate how you turn everything into a biblical reference. And because there's no arguing it. when it, it's, it's pretty plain. It's in there. It's definitely in there. Especially when you know the uh, prime evil character was reborn into this evil. We, we get his like original form as Tom Riddle, the perfect student. The angel. And he fell. Yes. And he fell to evil. And he got a snake and he just tore shit up. So. And, and, and who was the one... Uh, well, I don't know. But who's the one that, that set Voldemort off? I'm assuming it was Dumbledore. Not so much. Okay. Um, you'll get there. there. There's there's reasons why he does what he does. Okay. And most of it's just a struggle for power. You know, these kids seeking to kill the dangerous thing. Kids going underground via tunnel, via, via, uh, to, via pipes. Yes. Kids going underground via pipes to kill the dangerous thing in the dark place feels a lot like it again. Okay. Uh, I've always found it very interesting that there is this chamber, it does actually exist, and of all the wizards and witches who have gone through Hogwarts, and Dumbledore's there, he's the greatest wizard of all times, no one's found it. Dumbledore hadn't even found it? Dumbledore didn't know it was there. Is that what you're telling me? It existed, but no one knew where it was. Except Dumbledore didn't know the where only it was. person who could open it was the heir of Slytherin. They'd be able to find it and open it. So... It's there. They know there's a basilisk in there. There's something that's killing and petrifying people. You would assume with their knowledge of the wizarding world, they'd narrow it down. Oh, it's a basilisk. But the only people who can kill it are the second graders. <laughs> yeah. It's a little far-fetched in that sense. It seemed, the, the whole series seems to be a bit far-fetched when, when put against those terms. Okay. Right? That it is Harry Potter, the the first grader that comes in and solves the and wins the day the first time. Solves the mystery. Yeah, he he wins the day the second time. So, uh, the, I think the whole thing is going along those lines. Okay. Um, in the movies. You always ask this. I'm prepped. I'm Lock, ready. Lockhart. Yes. Is he played by an American actor? Does he have an American accent? No, he's not. Okay. He's played by an Englishman. Okay. He's played by Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh. Branagh, whatever else I guess. Kenneth Branagh. Yes, Shakespeare himself. Uh, because he couldn't make the part of Othello, he wanted to be Gilderoy Lockhart. He was every other great Shakespearean character. <laughs> so, so has Branagh ever written anything? I want to know this. I, I'm not sure. Does great with other people's work. Which isn't, yes. which isn't, which isn't uh, all that. He's a fine actor. Right. He is. Is, is not all that unique in in the Hollywood world, right? Okay. I mean, it, Hollywood is not a place that very often has visionary storytellers from the inception of an idea to its completion. Okay. And even then, actors are brought in. Even if you are write, produce, direct, and star in, you've got other actors along, right? So yes. nothing is nothing is just your piece in Hollywood. Unless it's Kenneth Branagh, because he <laughs> says, I'm going to direct, write, and be the star of this. Of Shakespeare. Of Shakespeare. <laughs> because I, it's mine. You didn't write Shakespeare, Branagh. <laughs> uh, he is Gilderoy Lockhart, though, and he does a fine job. Uh, one of my more favorite characters is uh, through his performance. Uh, absolutely wonderful. So I'm excited for you to see that. Okay, so we see Lockhart's fall yes. in this book. And I'm just going to ask this question. Does Lockhart appear later? No. He doesn't come back at all? Uh, mentions of him, but this this is the end. This is, this is it for Lockhart. Yeah, pretty much. Awfully disposable. Yes, very disposable. Uh, however, just dastardly, just absolutely dastardly, the way Lockhart works. So they erase the mind of someone and claim their victories. You tell me, as an author, going through publishing, there aren't some jabs there. Yeah, um, not, just, not just authorship, but in every field of art. Right? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is your college professor who publishes your paper under his name. This is Carlos Mencia going to the club and stealing other people's jokes. This yes. is Amy Schumer stealing other people's jokes. Um, that is an interesting case. Is there any? T tell me more about it. Hey, it's pretty cut and dry like that. I think that's what it is. This, so it. It's, you think it's, it's, Rowling, it's Rowling taking a jab at the entertainment industry. Okay. Because you do have people in the entertainment industry who are claiming things that are not their own and are receiving the renown for it. Lockhart is beloved by all people. He's also very good at it. And he is very good at it because he's a very charming sociopath. Yeah. 
and the only way he knows he can get away with it is by essentially eliminating his opposition. <laughs> well, he doesn't eliminate them. He eliminates their stories. I, I'm very disappointed we didn't have two people to just like cameo our channel and do this whole thing as like a, a huge <laughs> Lockhart joke. Uh, but we dropped the ball on that. Uh, Lucius Malfoy. Let's. I, I, I'm ready for this one. The last chapter we get to see Lucius in his true form. Okay. How do you feel about it? I mean, if you didn't see that coming, I'm not sure you're much of a real reader, okay. right? Um, I think that that is, when Dobby showed up, that was where you were, I think, naturally drawn to assuming he was from. Okay. Um, How do you create a more despicable character than being like, oh, we're going to make him a slave owner? Yeah. That's exactly what it was. Besides being a white supremacist. Besides right. being a white supremacist, he is also a slave owner. Right. Uh, we are going to find out a lot more about Lucius, uh, a lot more about the Malfoy family. Uh, we are also going to start to find out a lot more about the house elves. Uh, there is a lot going on there. Yeah. And it is just chilling the connections that are made with slavery. Uh, especially when we meet Creature. We'll get to creatures. How soon. does it get much more akin to slavery than it has already been mentioned as being? Uh, Dobby is the best way I could describe it, like a younger house elf who would be more apt to go for freedom. Uh, just to pull forward, eventually you meet a character named Creature who has served the same wizarding family for generations. And refuses to leave. No, Creature is what Creature is. Okay. And creature accepts it. And Creature hates what masters hate. And I wonder why you would name that creature just Creature. Creature. There's no name given. That's, that's his name, but that's, yeah. Okay. So we will get there. Uh, we also get with the House Elf Liberation Front. Uh, there's a lot going on with it. I got a lot still to talk about. Move on. You know, I've seen a lot of videos pop up on BookTube. And maybe they're not recently. Maybe I'm just getting them in my feed now. Mm -hmm where people are attempting to, basically what it is, is it's, it's censorship. Okay. Right, saying that I don't think that things and themes such as cheating should be in young adult literature. Um, I have seen that actually. Yeah, that's, that's very recent. That's censorship, right? Okay. Uh, why, like, that, that's how people learn about, some, literature is how people learn about something without having to experience it. Yes. Right. So to say that it, these things shouldn't be in literature is to say that, yeah, people should be absolutely fucking slapped in the face when it happens to them. And they should have not the tools to deal with them because they saw them someplace else. And we've had the banned book argument countless times. Right. Harry Potter is a very highly banned book. Right. But do you know why? Because, because of the magic in it. It's anti-Christian. It. It's anti-Christian. Uh, nothing about sexism, nothing about slavery, uh, nothing about any of that. It's just, well, there's magic in it. That's witchcraft. Well, let me bring this up. If it is okay to censor anything in a piece, mightn't children's literature be the place where it would be okay to censor? Uh, Before you have the tools to differentiate right from wrong based on who's doing things. Okay. Uh, when it comes to children's literature, I think the responsibility falls upon the parents. Uh, sure, but that is to say that a child is only able to be as responsible as his or her parents. Okay. If I had a child, would I feel comfortable letting them read Harry Potter? Absolutely. Uh, I would hope that it would bring up some questions as such we have discussed here. But I don't see anything wrong with it. Now, let's look back at Catcher in the Rye. We did that. Would you feel comfort comfortable having the child who is reading Harry Potter read the Catcher in the Rye? There's some older concepts going on in Catcher in the Rye. There's a little bit more. Do you censor it from them completely and say, here's the watered down version? Absolutely not. But do you wait till they're at maybe a more mature level to be able to comprehend it some more and maybe have more serious discussion about it? Maybe. I, I could get behind that. But this whole striking out the text and censoring the novel and giving you the watered down acceptable version is complete bullshit. Well, here's what I want to say about this novel. This is a novel that teaches children that your soul might be stolen through the act of writing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not a good thing to teach. No, not at all. Unless you're J.K. Rowling, you're wanting to get rid of competition, <laughs> then it's okay. It's Snuff acceptable. Snuff them out. Snuff them out early. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that's, that was something that was sort of, sort of troubling for me on a reader level as I am interpreting for a child. Okay. Like, how do you, how do you as a 
five-year-old, you're learning to write. How do you not pick up your first uh, journal, diary, whatever, and think, is this thing going to steal my soul? I think it is more along the lines of, just in its simplest form, don't trust strangers. Because think about it. This is not the diary, it's Tom Riddle. Right, but you're, you're viewing that through very adult eyes. Maybe I am. Maybe I am, but I, I don't think there is an innate fear that writing is going to steal my soul after reading this, even as a child. How old were you when you first read this book? Um, at middle school age. Okay, that's, that's way past yes. what would have been acceptable. Yes, that's creepy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when's the first time you read this? 30. Uh, a week ago. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, I win. Um, I, it's hard to say. It is very hard to say because the mind of a child is a m the mind of a child. And sometimes through that, you do come up with just epiphanies. You're like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. But I, I, could, I couldn't say that they think that writing was going to steal their soul. But speaking of soul stealing, this next book we're getting into, we're going to dabble into that a little bit. And the idea of the soul and what that means to humanity, and the idea of death, how characters are going to deal with death. So again, we are pushing forward with more adult themes, and I think it's very important, because as the characters age, the reader ages, and the topics discussed have to be a little more adult. Well, I'm certainly excited to see some of these characters die. But that's, that's promising. We're so. moving forward. If it makes you feel any better, none of the ones that you like are probably going to die. It's just gonna be the ones you don't care about. I don't like many. Okay. Well, the seventh book is for you. It's a slaughter. Slaughterhouse? Yeah. Slaughterhouse 7? It kind of is. Uh, that woman kills more characters in that book. It just left and right. Is she as it's bad as uh, Game, Game of, of Thrones, Thrones style? Guy? It's George R.R. R. Martin writes Harry Potter. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway. Here's something. We, we bring up the question of religion a lot. Okay. Did you notice um, where Voldemort got his Slytherin blood? where Voldemort got his Slytherin blood? Right. What are you getting at here with this? Voldemort's father yes. was a muggle. Yes. His his mother was a witch. Are you 100% sure that's not flopped? I'm fairly positive. I mean, I know you are correct. One of them is a muggle, but for some reason I was thinking it was his mother. No. Okay. Uh, uh, somebody's... Somebody's mother in here is a muggle, but it's not, it's okay. not Voldemort. But yes, you are right. M Voldemort is... Mudblood. Well, if I'm wrong about this, be sure to curse Dalton out in the comments below. But, uh, Voldemort, do, do you know what religion acts that way? Religion that acts that way? There's a religion that you are inherit. You inherit the religion through your mother's blood. Judaism? Yes. Potter's father was a wizard. Okay. Potter's mother was muggle, right? No. Are you sure? Yes, 100%. Lily and James Potter were both wizards. But was she... Did she adopt it? No. Okay. Uh, now what you're thinking of is his aunt, which would be Dursley. Our, which is okay, a okay. If, if you're positive, you're positive. I'm 100% sure. That, but, uh, uh, yeah, that 100% sure. You're only Jewish if your mother is Jewish. Okay. And the heir of Slytherin was Voldemort, right? Okay. So we're making a case for Judaism now. No, uh, we're, we're making a case for the fact that um, even more white supremacy is latent in this novel. Would you but it's say from the opposite viewpoint? Would you say that Voldemort is akin to Adolf Hitler then? Was Adolf Hitler a Jew? I believe so. Okay. And well, what I don't is know. Voldemort's ultimate goal? He's essentially trying to purge. Right. And create this um, perfect power race of wizards and witches. Which is interesting when you set it up as, with the Jewish dynamic. Yes. I think so, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of Judeo-Christian elements to this. I mean, you did talk about the uh, tree of knowledge, uh, the symbolism of the snake, the fallen angel of uh, Voldemort and Tom Riddle. And I, I wasn't aware of the whole thing with the you inherit your Judaism through your mother. Yeah. Uh, so that is very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm trying to like on the fly like link something else together, but nothing's coming to mind since you slapped me in the face with that on the side. Uh, so what else you got? 
You know, it was interesting. In the last series of chapters, Percy refused to muggle studies as a soft option, almost like psychology is a soft science. Yes. Um, so when you've got this idea that studying the muggles is a soft science, and you've got these people who have magic as a superior race. Okay. Is there anything to be made of that? Uh, when I read that, I thought that was more so as a jab at Percy's father, who is in the muggle arts. That That's his job at the uh, ministry. Uh, I think that was more so of the rebellion of the youth to, you know, get away from the father. Uh, now, speaking of Percy, though, you had a lot of thoughts thinking that Percy was going to have some switch here. I did. Were you let down? A little bit. I would hope so. A little bit. I would certainly hope especially so. Especially when you, when you come to, to the realization that uh, Tom Riddle was the prefect before. Yes. If Percy, if he were able to, if Voldemort were able to get one over on the current prefect, that would be a pretty powerful twist, right? I think so. Uh, but that's not what happened. Uh it was a little disappointing, and I think also still interesting that, and again, we had this Scooby-Doo conversation with the first book. It's a little ridiculous that the only way that Harry Potter knew who Tom Riddle was is that he polished a trophy with Tom Riddle's name. Right. It is known that Tom Riddle well, became that was, Voldemort. That was, that was Tom, or that was Ron, right? Ron polished the trophies. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a little ridiculous, especially if it's known that Tom Riddle eventually became Voldemort, that he, they'd keep his trophies in the school. Right. So there was, some, there was some stretching on a writer's standpoint. Yeah, because Harry was helping uh, uh, Ilch? Lockhart. Lockhart. Remember? Yes, you are correct. Sign his fan mail. Now, um, a small cross-literary reference. The Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers, I'm assuming, are being set up as red shirts. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, Those guys don't last. Things are going to change in the end. Uh, there's a reason for that. But as of right now, absolutely, they're red shirts. You know, I've, I've brought up a lot of things about sexism. Okay. All the moving parts here are male. Heroes are male, villains are male, women are damsels in distress. Okay. What does it say that uh, the only parcel tongues that have existed, at least to this point in, in the series, have been male? Uh... Are you trying to get at uh, the male as the sharp-tongued, uh, the talker, the smooth talker? Is that what you're getting at here? Well, sell me on that. Sure. I mean, I think that'd be my obvious, I, because isn't that uh, a saying? He's sharp-tongued, like, like a serpent's tongue. tongue. Silver yeah. tongue, yeah. And that's associated with a male's thing, because that leads to the seduction of someone. I think that's generally, that's what the gender identifies it with. Okay. Um, I think where it, were you going with that? I was going with the fact that you o crack open the Bible. Okay. Crack open the Old Testament. Who are the players? The men. Men. Uh, which goes back to the fact that these books were man-made. And I don't mean that in the sexist language that it sounds. They were uh, genuinely man-made. Genuinely written by men of the day. For men. Yeah. And women were not a part of that. Um... So I think there's definitely something to be said there. I don't know. I, I want to argue the sexism card so much. Well, go ahead. We do get stronger female characters in later novels. Well, is this because Rowling was at a point in her career where she was big enough to be chided by feminists? I, I don't think you could say she was chided by feminists. I think as she grows as a writer, she began to incorporate more elements into her well, writing. Why couldn't she have done that earlier? Was she not a forward-thinking individual? I'm not sure on that. I mean, I, history goes to say at least what she has told us, that she planned a lot of this out ahead of time. Well, it's very easy to plan ahead of time and then change as things come up. Uh, now, there is a character, because there is a villainous female eventually. Uh, so I am interested to see how you're going to take her, because I think that particular book is going to kill you. You are going to hate that character with such an unbridled passion that you will refuse to read that book. Is this the one that the centaurs take away? Actually, yes, it is. Well, then is that a very feminist statement? Well, I mean, the bad woman got raped by the centaurs. All is well now. Explain that a little bit for, for anyone who's just jumping on the okay, train. Okay, so uh, this is jumping way ahead. If you don't know anything about centaurs... When the Which, by the way, as soon as they... I want to toot my own horn here, toot toot. As soon as they popped up... He knew. He knew. Adrian was on the case, uh, right? Because in, in, in 
Classical mythology, centaurs are rape machines. So put your earmuffs on. When the centaurs take Dolores Umbridge to the forest, that's what happens there. Good for you. Uh, so now that everybody's got that out of the way, uh, basilisks, if we're going to talk about mythology. Go ahead. Uh, you said you thought it was very interesting that she included mythology with the centaurs. That was one of the first things that really caught your eye, and you're like, okay, there's something here. Now we've got Phoenix, yes. Fox the Phoenix. Now we have a basilisk, uh, yes. giant spider, more just monstrous, nothing to there. Uh, but we are going to get more classic elements of mythology, especially in this next book. There is a central character who is a mythological beast. Well, it's very interesting also in this book that we get all of these giants, right? Because okay. that's very classical. It right? is. Hagrid's always kind of been there. He's a semi-giant, right? He's like a he's, half giant. Is, is that what it is? Okay. He's a half giant. So you've got giant spiders. You've got a giant snake, right? Is that, um, is that playing into the fear of children of being small people? Maybe or is it so. playing into classical mythology? But how would you argue for Dobby then? Because Dobby is obviously very powerful with magic. We saw Dobby blast Lucius Malfoy away when he threatened Harry Potter, and Dobby is tiny. So I'm not sure if I can agree with you there that you were saying that uh, the, st bigger the, the st bigger the character, the stronger they are towards a child. Right, but but the children still feel vulnerable because they're small. I, I could, yes. Vulnerability, absolutely. So is this simply a case of, well, we'll introduce a big snake and we'll introduce big spiders because they'd be scary as hell to someone who is three feet tall? Well, I think, again, in these, the early stages of this novel, it is good to say the bad things are creatures. They're not humans. People aren't bad, except this one guy. Because we don't have a lot of bad characters yet. Uh, as we grow in the pieces, we start getting, again, more adult themes, and we realize that the people aren't inherently good. So I, it's understandable, especially for a small child reading the first time, that the bad thing is a giant snake, or the bad thing is a giant spider. Uh, but we are setting up the humans and the people and the witches and wizards who have gone bad. Okay. We've got this quote about Slytherin. Okay. Um, they are noted for their resourcefulness, determination, and disregard for rules. I'll be goddamned I'm a Slytherin. You're a Slytherin. And still, I'm a Ravenclaw. Each, each book goes to back this up. I still, by the way, for those of you playing along at home, um, <laughs> I think it's important to note what we really know about the other schools at this point because I'm assuming that everyone in the Harry Potter world knows what you mean when you say that. Yes. I, only having made it through book two so far, have no idea what Ravenclaw means. Okay. I know what Slytherin is. I know what Gryffindor is. We we had who not a Ravenclaw. What's the oh we had a Hufflepuff, who participated in this novel. Yes, that's it. That's you, all we've had. You don't find out much about Ravenclaws or Hufflepuffs. Just just this and that here and there. Uh, Gryffindor and Slytherins are the big ones. But when we came on this and we did our interview where we figured out which house we were in, I said I'm a Ravenclaw and you're a Slytherin. Everybody was like, yeah, that makes, sense. That makes perfect sense. So, yeah, that's, that's what it is. You're left out of this one. Yeah, I, I still have no idea what that is. Um, now, the final thought that I have, which will play much larger into the wrap-up video that this is. Um, you know, last week we talked a little bit about what happens in your school if passing period comes and there's just a kid unconscious with his legs broken in the middle of the okay. hallway, right? That's a big deal. Yes, it is. We have in this novel, f that happened five times. Yes. And school's still not shut down. Correct. But what I wonder is, is that a commentary on the fact that, okay, at a high school, it takes that to shut you down, right? At a middle school, it might take something less. Grade okay. school, something less in, in, entirely. Absolutely. So is it just a comment on, on does this type of schooling just invite an escalated amount of inherent danger. So what would it take for the, like last time we mentioned Columbine, that sent shockwaves through the entire uh, American school district. Um, I'm assuming that was a, a worldwide known event. Okay. That, that people from other countries knew about that. Um, Let, so what does it take? What would that Columbine level event be in a school such as this. Let me skate this very gently, again, not to spoil anything for you. Pretty much nothing shuts down. 
Hogwarts, including professors openly murdering other professors. It's an interesting commentary. So, you, you sit on that one and you dwell on it a bit. Well, but we're also talking about a world in which dueling is still very much... The, the case, dueling right? is a thing. This is the American West, pull out your guns and take your ten steps. Right. Uh, w which is interesting. Uh, and I think you can get away with that in the children's novel because this isn't considered violent dueling. No one's getting shot. People are being knocked unconscious. But people are being knocked unconscious, but it's magic. It's not physical violence. It's magical violence, for lack of better terms. Now, again, as things progress, the, violent, the uh, magic becomes more violent, uh, in which, towards the sixth novel, they discover a spell which essentially is a slash. It's like using a sword. It just slashes and cuts. Uh, the Unforgivable Curses, where there are three spells that are basically illegal. Uh, there's one that controls whoever you want. You can force them to do whatever you want. You can force them to drown themselves. Uh, and then, of course, the Avada Kedavra, Killing Curse, which instantly kills someone. Anagata Davida Killing Curse? Anagata Davida Killing Curse. Anagata Davida. Not a single person is old enough to recognize no. what you just said. <laughs> I'm surprised you got it. I thought I was just going to bite hard on that. So, we're going to move on. On to what? Harry Potter. I, you promised we would be doing Lord of the Rings. And the Prisoner of Azkaban. That's not what you said. We will get to Lord of the Rings after we get through... Five more years of Harry Potter. Five more five more books. Yes. It might take five years. It might take five years. It will feel like five years. So the next one, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, we're going to get some more adult themes. We're going to be introduced to Dementors, which are soul-sucking guards of the I Prisoner like of already. Azkaban. Uh, this is your novel. Uh, this one deals a lot more with the concept of depression. Uh, the concept of death and how these characters are going to deal with death. Do suicidal elements come up? We've already, got, we've already got teasers of them in this novel. There is one character who is... He deals with a burden. And his method of coping could be considered... I, th I think we could tie that self -harm? together. It's not self-harm. It. We'll get there. All right. But I think you're going to like it. I really think you do. So if you would like to join us on the next segment of Adrian Reads Harry Potter, where we move into The Prisoner of Azkaban, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, because what days are we having Harry Potters now? They're Wednesdays. Yes. Every Wednesday is Harry Potter. That's delightful. Why and is wonderful. That delightful? Because every Wednesday is Harry Potter. It's every week you get a dose of Harry Potter. Well, right. But does Wednesday mean anything special in the Harry Potter world? Not really, but I'm just excited that it's a weekly thing now. That makes one of us. That makes one of us. Follow us on... <laughs> On Twitter at Strip Cover, on Facebook at Strip Cover Lit, and on Instagram at Strip Cover Lit. Strip you cover sounded lit. so stressed having to force that out after that. I'm so happy. <laughs>